You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So week two, we're in this series called The Good News. The original Greek word for this is euangelion. And hidden in that word, like a little Easter egg gift, is this word angelos. Angelos, which means angel. So you have this word that says there's really good news and into it is tucked. There's also a messenger. But the euangelion is also ours to own. And we are also messengers of this. But today we're going to lean in and we're going to talk again about another encounter with that angel Gabriel who came and said something to a young woman. It's a story we get very familiar with, but I would like to brush back the borders of comfortable engagement with scripture and maybe deal with it on a bit more raw um, and um, unfriendly ground. What it would feel like, where it would, where it would hit you. I think the idea of the, of the statement, the Lord is with you that takes place within this scripture, God is with you is something we need to cling on to and grab. Most of the times we don't grab onto words like that unless we really need God to be with us. Most of the time we hope he didn't see what we just did rather than take comfort in the fact that he's with us. So today we lean in. I do know this, that there is some comfort in having people we know and love with us in situations maybe where we're a little uncomfortable, where we're we're afraid, right? I know this, my, my granddad and I struck up a friendship um, when I was uh, 15 years old. He would uh, come to California and he would go to the school. He didn't even ask my parents. He'd just go sign me out, which I'm like, you're yeah, granddad. Um, and he would take me and he'd say, I need ham and eggs. And I'm like, I need to go to the beach. Seems like we've got a winning combination here, granddad. And off we would go. And we would go spend a day in San Diego, just he and I. And um, he would always tell the waitresses, this young man's single. And I'm like, it's because of things like that I remain single, granddad. And, um, and we would have these talks and he would tell me about World War II. He was a veteran in World War II. He would tell me of what the Battle of the South Pacific was like. And he would just talk to me about how hot it was on the ship and different things. And I would just sit kind of glued to my granddad listening to him. And I remember him telling me of what it was like when when these flatlanders from Tonkawa, Oklahoma, moved in the Dust Bowl uh, Depression years to Grand Junction, Colorado. And they moved to a farmstead on South Rim of the Grand Valley, on the South Rim of the Grand Valley. And uh, they had this farmstead out there. And every day, Carl, his older brother and my granddad, um, would play marbles. And they would shoot marbles. And my uncle Carl would just basically, he was his older brother, he always won. And my granddad would lose all his marbles. And uh, And then there would be this deal made. Because at the end of the day, Grandpa Curtis would say to Carl, hey Carl, go lock up the barn. And, uh, and this was a time when there were still animals in the valley, in the Grand Valley, that, um, that maybe, you know, they've kind of scurried up into the mountains now, but you're always scared of wolves, of coyotes, the occasional black bear and cougars and things like that. The animal, not the lady. And, um, and so there were, well, there just weren't cougars yet. And um, so So they would, you know, they were always nervous. And so my uncle Carl would say, Kenny, if you'll go with me, I'll give you all your marbles back. They would leash up the dogs, get the lanterns and be like, oh, oh." and out into the darkness of an old farmstead in a low light valley, they would sneak out and they would face their fears together. There's something to the idea of someone saying, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. You don't have to face it alone. When we talk about our faith, we have to understand that these are the words of God into our life. I'll go with you. I'll go with you into that place you fear the most, into that thing you don't understand. I'll go with you into the valley of grief, into the valley of illness, to the valley of the shadow of death. I will walk with you. I will accompany you on your journey. I'll go with you. 
It doesn't mean everything will be fine, but it does mean that the one who's knit everything together is with us. And all things indeed will work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. The idea of an older brother saying to the younger brother, hey, if you go with me, what comfort did that bring? It brought a ton of comfort. And the two boys would venture off towards the barn and lock it down, make sure nothing got in at night, make sure all the lanterns were out and different things, and then they would come back safe to the house. And my granddad said, usually we had let the dogs go and we ran like something was chasing us because in their mind, something was chasing them, right? I don't know about you, but I grew up like when I thought maybe something was behind me, I just ran. And that's what they would do. But in this life, we get to step back and see maybe... Maybe we can just stand firm in the confidence of a God who says, I'll go with you. Today's text um, is coming out of Luke. And what we're going to do is look at this and understand what it's like when a scary situation is called for us. Luke 1, 26 to 38 says this. In the sixth month, sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel, the same angel, angel he sent to Zechariah. He sent him to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. I think this is important. A lot of times we get people who say, you know, greetings, you who are highly favored. I want you to understand something. Mary had done nothing to encounter the goodness and the favor of God other than God choosing her. She was ordinary, average, just Mary. The favor on her life was that God took notice. The favor on our life is that God takes notice. He says, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I love this next question. I think you could rephrase it. Well, whose son is this going to be? Who's, whose kid is? What, what? Like, I know we think it's kind of cool because we understand the immaculate conception, the conception of Christ by the Holy Spirit. But imagine this teenage girl being like, so who's the daddy? She'd never been with a man. I mean, she, maybe she had had the talk with mom, you know, already, but she had to be like, there's no bee to go with the bird here. You know, there's, hmm, biology, I don't know. Maybe it just seemed like, who, who's, who's, who's he going to be the son of? She said it this way. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And I want you to take note. She did believe. She wondered how, not if. She wondered how, not if. Zechariah, just a week ago, when Phil taught, showed us how he said, how can I be sure? He was a little more jaded. Life had calloused him up a little bit. His prayers had gone unanswered so long that he kind of went, yeah, how can I be sure? And the angel said, you won't talk for the next nine months. How about that? To which I'm sure he just nodded right? He's like, oh, you know, this is just kind of like, feel the texture of it. How can this be? I'm a virgin. How can this be? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word of God will ever fail. Amen. I love that line. No word of God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. That is a powerful scripture. That is a powerful scripture. I want you to imagine with me, maybe we just live in this for a few minutes. It had been four 
hundred years since the people of God, the Jews, had heard a word from the Lord. The glory of God had never indwelt the temple they were now living in, the temple built after the exile. They had been living in stark, utter silence for four centuries. Not a word from God. And suddenly, an angel appears to a teenage girl in Nazareth, in the northern part of Israel, and he says to her, greetings, you who are, who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. How many times do you think people in Israel ask the question, is he still with us? Or are we just doing these rules because we have to? Like, think with me what it felt like for her to be like, oh my word, he's, he's still here. His glory may not be resting in the temple, but that was an angel. And he identified himself. He told her who he was. And we understand that for her, it would have been unbelievable. It would have been unbelievable. But there's two big promises. There's two big promises that go on in this that I think are worth dealing with. With the present reality of the temple or the tent of God, so the temple from the days of Moses, the tabernacle through David and Solomon with the temple, the presence of God had been with his people until they were exiled in 586 BC. And after 400 years of silence, God is declaring his presence once again. And God is saying that what he's promising her, that what she's about to go through, what is gonna happen is going to be with a God who will go with her into the process. She won't go into it alone. She won't endure it alone. She will endure it and walk through it with God present with her. And this is a gift to her because when it says the Lord is with you, that is a promise that Israel was holding on to on a silken thread by this point. After 400 years, I think they maybe thought, I think we just ticked him off and he's not listening anymore. He's not responding. Have you ever gotten to an argument with somebody who's passive aggressive and you get, mm-hmm, sure. Would you like to go to dinner? Whatever. Oh, how does Chinese sound? Hmm. They walk off and you're like, are you mad? Mm -mm. Okay. You want to see a movie? And you're like, speak to me. I'm desperate. I cannot be ignored. Erica knows this. You ignore me for 30 seconds. I'm like a kid with a drum set. I'm like, dang, dang, dang. I start throwing things in the air, pouring flour on the floor and screaming. I cannot be ignored. I can't take it. If Erica ever wants to really kind of <clears throat> put the screws to me, excuse me, <clears throat> that was nice. Um, <clears throat> if she ever really wants to kind of put the screws to me, she'll just get quieter. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> right, 30 seconds in, I'm, I'm just putty. 400 years, I would just be flat on the floor, just, <clears throat> I couldn't take it. I couldn't take 400 years of quiet. Give me four minutes and I'll beg for mercy, right? The Lord is with you. God is with you. You're not alone. It's a promise we hold on to. The second promise is this, that he will be called the son of God. He answers Mary's early question. How can this be? How can this be? Whose boy will this be? How will we name him? If he's not Joseph's son, and I've never known a man, who's the dad? And he says, he will be called the son of God in verse 34. In verse 34, when we see this, I think what, the way we could distill it in our head is the angel could say, if an, our modern vernacular would say, this child is gonna be bigger than the scandal brewing in your head, Mary. His coming about is intentional. His coming to life is intentional. And the scandal in your head of me, of going, well, but I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. I'm engaged. And I'm going to say this is the son of God. What, what? And the, the way her head would start spinning. And he said, this will be the son of God. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you will conceive and carry a child. I love that. I love the raw 
unfiltered invitation to walk with the Son of God and bear the Son of God into the world in such a stark and painful way. There's no way to like clothe this nicely. This is a terrifying invitation. This is a terrifying invitation. And Gabriel finishes it with this phrase, no word of God will ever fail. I want you to remember who we talk about right now. No word of God will ever fail. Remember what happened with Zechariah the week before when he said to the angel, how can I be sure? And the angel gave him his assurance and muted him for the next nine to 10 months. But then what happens? What does Gabriel say? Like, listen to this. Have you, like, just, I want you to hold on to this. You're standing in the, in the holy place in the temple of Israel, burning incense. You're Zechariah, the priest. An angel tells you these things. Your prayers have been answered. And all of a sudden, you question it, you fall mute. And the angel says this, I am Gabriel, and I stand before God. That's a moment where you just kind of do that thing when a kid's scared and you go, hmm. It just runs through you. Oh my gosh. And he can't respond. He can't say anything. I am Gabriel. I stand before God. Gabriel means messenger of God. I stand before God and I speak on his behalf. And when Gabriel speaks, it's the word of God. What we're saying is when, when Gabriel says, no word of God will fail, that's a direct quote from the throne room of eternity. And that quote applies to your life and mine. No word of God will ever fail. So I wanna say just a little something for you and for me. If you are tired of flippant words, of hollow promises, and people with no follow through and no integrity, I will tell you this, if you trust in people, you will be broken and failed at every turn. People fail, but the word of God never does. I offer up the person and the word of God as a lasting and unbroken promise for you to hold on to. The same way a teenage girl held on to the promise of God when people said, yeah, okay, Mary, that's God's baby because you know what happened. He's the son of the carpenter, wink, nudge, right? She held on to the promise of God and believed what Gabriel said. No word of God will ever fail. So I offer you the person and the word of God as a lasting example of the promise, the integrity, and the character of a God who loves you and came to you in the most unlikely of ways. The good news would be delivered by an angel to a young girl who had to be absolutely gobsmacked by what just happened to her life. She probably had it planned out. She was marrying a builder. She was gonna have sweet furniture because they can build cool stuff. She was gonna have a husband who worked hard, probably a bunch of kids, and try to live as well as they could under Roman rule. And God threw a wrench into the plans. But then we find this other thing that takes place. This promise that says he will be called the son of God. And you would think as Mary growing older that, um, you know, the, let's look at the life of Jesus. 30 years, Jesus' life was pretty much seen um, in, in two little glimpses. You have the Christmas story. Then you have the story when he was like 10 or 12 in the temple and got left behind. But he lived 30 years and it was primarily undocumented. There's not a lot of um, notes on who Jesus was. He was an average young man who became probably a decent, good carpenter. I think he's probably a really good carpenter, not decent. But um, yeah. oh, um, so, so you have this guy who's a great carpenter and... Um, <laughs> constructor of the world and universe. And uh, he's a great carpenter. He's, he's got this life going. He's living with his parents at 30, which would have been very out of the ordinary. Uh, he, normally they would have been married. And at 30 years old, he's baptized by John the Baptist and his ministry begins. His ministry begins. See, I think for 30 years, Mary probably wondered, nobody's really saying he's the son of God. I want you to fast forward from the angel talking with Mary, saying he will be called the son of God to the foot of a cross where the son of God hung. And a Roman who had just crucified Jesus Christ, 
stood below him, looked up, and reminded Mary of the promise when he said, surely this man is the Son of God. That's an amazing moment. That's an amazing moment. Because in that we find, as her boy is dying on a cross, and she's going, for the past few years, he's been the Messiah. He's been all these things. What is going on? How could this be the end? How could this be God's plan? Why? This is her boy. She loved him. She knew him. How could this be what's happening? And then out of the mouth of one of the men who helped crucify Jesus Christ, the confession that Gabriel promised the world would know of Jesus Surely this man is the son of God. And I wonder if the tears froze on her cheeks and was like, what is happening? How can that be revealing the son of God? How can this be happening? Join me in looking at this a little more raw and seeing that no word of God has yet failed because even on the cross, Roman centurions who were godless pagans and they had gods all over the place. They had the Greek gods, the Roman gods and any other gods they could get their hands on one stood at the foot of the cross of a dying man and said, this was the son of God. This was the son of God. And the word of God has not failed yet again. It is held true. So I want to take a moment and I want to apply this to our lives in a bit of a, a personal way. In a way that, um, well, maybe some words that ring out to us, even into our generation. When Jesus says, well, he's saying these words to you. Surely I am with you to the very end of the age. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't really matter how you feel about it. He's with you. In these places, he's with you. And in you goes the good news, the euangelion, the promise that there is a God who has sought and found us the broken of humanity and called us back to himself. The good news is that he will go with us, that God is with you. So now that you know that Jesus Christ was promised to Mary, that he would be God with you, Emmanuel is the term for that, and he would be the son of God, and truly that was fulfilled. Now you can know that Jesus Christ in his last words said, I'm gonna be with you even to the end of the age. I'm not going anywhere. You can trust me. No word from the Lord ever fails, amen? So we hold on to this and we know that for us, we can grab onto the words of Jesus. And when he says, I am with you to the very end of the age, we can reach right out and grab the tandem line next to it and say, the word of the Lord never fails. No word of God will ever fail, ever. The word of God is sure, it is steadfast, and it is unbreakable over your life and over mine. And he has spoken the truth over us. He has called us Christian one made into the image of Christ. And that is an unbreakable promise and gift to you. So I'm gonna invite you to something. I'm gonna invite you to respond in the way that Mary did. To respond in a way that a young teenage girl, most likely standing dead alone in a darkened room, probably cooking or preparing something on a dirt floor, kind of adobe hut, when the angel who stands before God approached her in her own house and said, this is what's gonna happen. I wanna invite you to courage today because it took courage. It took, in the face of terror, bravery for Mary to say these words. May it be unto me as you have said. What if the church responded to the call of God like that? Each one of you bears a calling in this life. Your life is not your own. It was bought at a price. The price was the blood of Christ. What if the church responded knowing that no word of God would ever fail by saying, may it be unto me as you have said? What if we mustered the courage of a 14 to 15 year old girl and squared our shoulders up and said, I'm not up to the task, but you are. And if you want to make in me 
the king of kings, may it be unto me as you have said. Because don't forget what the angel said. The Lord is with you. And that promise extends not just to Mary, not just to Joseph, not just to the disciples, but to you and to me. Over the ages, over the millennia, the Spirit of God has hovered close to the church. He has whispered ideas, dreams, and tremors of the kingdom of God shaking the foundations of this earth. He has called us to do crazy things like, I don't know, make a produce section into a church. Start making ships that are hospitals and go meet the needs of the poor and needy. Start having campuses outside of your normal church campus where the body meets and, and send them out and go be missional in, in Holland and soon to the east and to the south. Maybe even another one down by downtown. Get a bunch of college kids worshiping. Maybe build a building, I don't know. But there's been these tremors of the kingdom of God shaking the foundations and the rules of this universe because the Lord is with his church. Amen? Amen? Let us never be afraid and think that this is our deal, that this is my deal. This is his church. He came to redeem us. He didn't need us. He wanted us. He loved us. He chose us. So let us hold on to this truth that the Lord is with you. Today, as much as he was with Mary that day, when the angel stood before her, the Lord is with you. Will you be as willing, courageous, and obedient as this teenage girl to let your life carry the Son of God forward in this world? Do you realize that we are all pregnant with the gospel? Have you ever thought about it? The call to Mary is no different than the call to you and I. Take the Son of God and bear him into this world. Bear him into this world. If there is one thing this church is for, it is for people meeting the Son of God through your everyday, ordinary life. You are the next generation of disciples. You are the Peter, the Paul, the Thomas, the James. You are the church. The Lord is with you. His word has never failed. He has called you, equipped you, and gifted you. Live with the courage enough to echo the words of Mary. May it be unto me as you have said, Lord Jesus Christ. Your love is boundless and it is um, like a river, God. I, I can't even put it into words what it means to be part of what you love. It's just a force of nature and we thank you for that. Thank you that your church continues to expand as you desire. Give us courage to participate where you're at work and help us abandon the projects that are of our own desires. Lord, we hold on today that no word from you will ever fail. So God, I pray that you would speak a word over the lives of your church. Call them into ministry in the various vocations, schools, and places that they live in. May your ministry go forward through them. No matter our profession, may our ministry be that of carrying the Son of God forward into this world. God, give us the courage to not see, I don't know, Lord, numbers, to not see things as too big, but to see the God of heaven who says no word of God will ever fail. So Lord, we ask, speak for your people are listening. And then God, give us the courage to echo the words of Mary. May it be unto us, even as you have said, because we know this, you love us. And into that sure and steadfast hope, we cling on this day. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. This is a great time to stand, sing. We're going to sing Reckless Love. I think it fits. Please join me. One, two, three, four, five, six. If Satan is the father of lies, he will tell you every excuse and reason why this didn't apply to you. Why it's not for you. You'll have excuses and you say, you know what? I don't know if this is for me. Here's what God did. From the most elite of Jewish society, the high priest burning incense inside the Holy of Holies to a teenage girl betrothed and literally considered property in the ancient world, God gave the same word. He called kind of bookends and everything in between of humanity fits. You're called. 
like a teenage girl was called. You're called like a tired old man was called. I don't care who you are, what your excuse is, you're called to bear forward into this world the living Son of God. We are the church. We are the bearers of good news. Euangelion, good news, and hidden within that is angelos, messengers. Go and be, well, messengers. So that when you leave, someone would say, it's like an angel found me. It's like somebody brought a word directly from God into my life. Go bring the kingdom of God to bear in the small things, in the big things. Just be faithful and know that if God prompts your heart to do something, the word of God will never fail and he'll be with you in it. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, the church must leave the building. Go straight to a tent, but leave the building. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.